media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Oh, it's great to talk to you. We're certainly, uh, you know, we're nearing the end of the year, but I think it's an interesting juncture moment uh, in the financial markets, too. Well, if there was going to be a Santa rally, this is a strange way to start it. Two days uh, with well, sharp decreases on the stock markets. Yeah, well, you know, last month, uh, also, the week of Thanksgiving, historically, is actually the one in which the market statistically will go up. The, you know, we'll have an up week. If, if there's going to be an up week, it's the week of Thanksgiving. And it was a down week, too. Um so that's uh, interesting. So the oddities, I guess, uh, uh, at least the defiance of these seasonal trends is continuing, as, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, when we see two sharp declines like it, like this, is it the the Fed meeting, uh, the threat of higher interest rates? I, I think that has a lot to do with the uh, long term outlook for the stock market. I mean, what's going to happen next year? Uh, but, you know, we have the Fed meeting as we're speaking now. It's going to be tomorrow, and we are dropping into it. Yesterday, the market was down. It's down today. On a short-term basis, though, that makes me hopeful that we could have, uh, you know, a couple up days before the end of the week after the Fed meeting because markets tend to fall into bad news and then go up once it's out. So on a short-term basis, that makes me a little bit optimistic, but – uh, when I look out to next year, I really think these are overall uh, negative things, higher inflation, um, you know, two months in a row now, the CPI has come out as over 6% annualized percentage, uh, the, the highest rate uh, in uh, since the 80s, really, uh, you got to 81, actually, and I think it's very similar to the start of the 1970s, but the big problem is interest rates are still zero and they're they're so low that they have no negative impact on stopping inflation so they have to go up if inflation is going to go away and uh, bridgewater had an interesting note a couple uh, days ago saying that when you have high inflation uh, the only way it's ever ended is when there's higher rates and a contraction in the economy. Uh, never has inflation just gone away when it gets this high by itself. So uh, I think that's what we're heading at is I think we're at a, uh, a secular low in yields uh, in the bond market, and they're going to go up, and that will eventually – uh, have a negative impact on the stock market. I mean, it's causing some short-term gyrations, a pickup in volatility, but I think it's going to be more than that. I think, frankly, we're heading into a bear market next year. And um, one of the indicators that has me uh, pretty much convinced of this is the percentage of stocks uh, above their 200-day moving average uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. And that indicator was at 90% uh, back uh, in February uh, when there's a peak in uh, things such as the ARK ETF, many of the crypto coins, speculation in the market. And that indicator has slowly gone down ever since then. But uh, last month, the indicator plunged very quickly uh from 65% down to below 42%, a very sharp plunge. And uh, that happened uh, the week of Thanksgiving and carried over the first day of December. 
so that even though the S and P really didn't pull back that much, there was a deep pullback in most stocks in the stock market, and this is really uh, how bear, bull markets typically come to an end, or you enter uh, what I call a stage three top. I, I like to divide the market up into four stages. Uh, stage two is a bull market. Stage three, the top, a topping process. Um, stage the next stage three is a bear market, and and then you have an in between. I mean, stage four is a, a bear market, and then stage one is a basing phase to build into a new bull market. But if when I look at this indicator, these rapid plunges uh, in this in, it typically occur uh, within weeks. Uh, before a new bear market starts or right as it starts. And you really got to go back to August of 2007 to find a, a similar plunge in this indicator in which the averages are still close to their highs. And back then, it happened when there was a the start of the negative impact of the mortgage uh, securities uh, Going down in 2007, a hedge fund blew up, um, and and bank stocks took a tumble that August. The market, though, did rally for about almost eight weeks from that August low to make its final peak, then rolled over into a bear market that uh, lasted uh, almost two full years. So, you know, things don't exactly happen identical. Like, oh, now we're going to rally for eight weeks or something. Uh, but we are at a similar, I think, uh, turning point, and we're not seeing that one of the differences, it's not bank stocks, you know, blowing up, uh, last couple weeks, uh, or mortgages or something like that. Instead, what has been seeing the most intense of selling has been, uh, the most speculative, uh, high flying stocks that went up so much last year and a lot of them peaked out in February and they're typified by ETFs such as the ARK ETF uh, which holds many of these stocks stocks like Zoom uh, Coinbase uh, Robinhood uh, and so forth and you can if anyone pulls up the ARK ETF they'll see that it peaked out at 160 uh, around 160 in February and went to 90 basically uh, the other week, and it's now floating uh, above that. But there's, you know, many, many stocks that the CTF that does known that also have pretty similar chart patterns as the CTF. So this is what, where the real danger is in the stock market. It's stocks that had extreme valuations that were red hot a year ago, now lagging in, in their position, I think, to drag the market lower uh, next year. And, and it's a lot of similarities to, frankly, what happened in, in uh, the summer of 2000. You know, there's an Internet stock bubble that imploded that March, and it eventually started to drag the entire stock market down with it. Uh, so I, I think that's what we're heading for in 2000. And not coincidentally, you know, these sort of, topping phases in the market where things get more volatile leading to a bear market also happen you know when the fed gets more hawkish when the fed raises interest rates uh and so forth now i saw someone on bloomberg this morning say don't worry don't worry if the fed raises rates because our 100 years worth of data shows that the market tends to go up during the first three rate hikes and we haven't even had the first one yet so be bullish about the next couple months, maybe the next year. However, uh, that isn't a firm rule that happens 100% of the time. And in 2018, the stock market fell 20% when the Fed simply started talking hawkish. Um, So things don't always, you know, turn out. uh, They rhyme, but they're not identical in in these market cycles. And I would argue that this is going to, has to be a different time because we are in what is essentially the biggest financial bubble uh, that the United States has ever had. Because it's not just the stock market, it's the bond market itself. When rates are zero and, you know, the deficit's exploded and inflation's picking up, the Fed is trapped, uh, essentially. You know, 
it, it can't raise, it knows it can't raise rates too much, uh, or things will crash, uh, but it has to raise rates in order to stop inflation. So all they can do is raise, try to raise rates slowly and hope things don't completely uh, unwind and collapse on all of this, but we'll see. That's where we're at. Uh, that's the gamble that they are forced to take, and we're going to all be forced to live with. It's like uh, trying to balance the point of a needle on the edge of a razor blade, isn't it? Hike rates too much, you kill the economy, not enough, and inflation eats it alive. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect analogy. And, and the thing is, um, n- nobody, there's no way to know, they don't know, I, I can't tell you, what the number of rate hikes it would be that everything just starts collapsing. I mean, in 2000, they raised rates, I think, three times, may have only been twice, and everything imploded. You know, in 2007, they were able to do it well over, uh, you know, at least ten times over several years. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, you know, what the magic number is. But what I do know is that indicators – that, such as the one I mentioned before, the percentage of stocks by the turn-day moving average, they have, are now, you know, flashing red. Uh, <laughs> they're not flashing red, uh, yellow, they're flashing red. And I, I take that seriously. So w- what I'm doing is I've reduced months ago when the internal started to go down. I said, well, I'm not going to even try to hold to the peak. I'm just going to take some action now. All I did was reduce my stock holdings to 50 percent um and, you know whatever and that might be how some people invest all the time you know in the united states there's one major brokerage firm that's what they do for all their clients put them in 50 percent stocks 50 percent bonds and and rebalance and so forth now i, I came into the year 50 percent and went up to about 70 uh but i dropped down to 50 in june and uh, I feel comfortable having 50% of my money, uh, you know, only in stocks now. Um, I'm hoping to try to hedge uh, a bit through short ETFs or puts or, or shorting individual stocks. Uh, also, in the next couple weeks, uh, that's a tricky thing to do because, you know, sh- shorting is very difficult. You've got to get out uh, if you're wrong because you can lose a lot of money shorting and having things go up on you. And it, the easiest solution for people isn't really to try to short or hedge, but just make sure they got some sort of cash reserve, uh, you know, on hand so that when things do decline, uh, they are in a position to buy and not be scared, you know, because they're 100% in and now it's down 20% or whatever, 30% or maybe 10, whatever the number is that scares people, you know, everyone's different, but what often happens is people don't think ahead things fall and then they sell out on the bottom when they should be thinking ahead and getting themselves in a position so yeah if stuff does decline instead of being a seller they can be a buyer but to do it you got to sell now be willing to tell yourself i can't sell out at the top if it goes up a little more that's that's all right that's what i did in june the s&p went up a little more and i don't care you know uh, and then be patient, uh, cause there's no way really to predict how long a bear market would actually play out. And, uh, I mean, it could take a year, it could take six months, it could take three years. We, we have to watch things unfold, uh, as it happens. And, uh, we're not really, we're not really in a bear market yet either <laughs> with the S&P 500 and the Dow and the NASDAQ. They're all above their 150 and 200 day moving averages. However, uh, the ARK ETF is below the turn-day moving average. The Russell 2000 is uh, below the turn-day moving average. Also, uh, the New York Stock Exchange is sitting right on the 150-day moving average. And uh, more than 50% of stocks are already in bear market. So that's the state of the overall uh, stock market itself. And I take that. Uh, more as an indication of where things are going than simply what the S&P 500 is doing because it's so heavily weighted now by, you know, Apple and Microsoft and a, and a couple of stocks that have helped it perform better. Apple, you know, was at 150 
uh, four weeks ago and yesterday touched 180. So, you know, it's the biggest market cap weighted stock in the S&P 500. So, so it helps push up the whole thing, but that's not an indication of what the entire stock market's doing. We'll have more with Mike Swanson right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mike Swanson. Mike, all the uh, so-called meme stocks have really taken it on the chin, and the per- the company promoting them all, Robinhood, doesn't seem to be doing all that well itself. No, it's not. I mean, Robinhood, you know, the stock started trading uh, in August. It opened up around $35, and it had an initial surge all the way up to 85 You know, for five days, it became a mania stock. Uh, and we've seen this happen with many stocks that this year uh, that came out, and then all these people with Robinhood accounts poured into them and then they top out and just go down ever since. So as we, so that stock it hit, you know, went over 80 in August. And as we're speaking, it's a new 52 week low today trading uh, at $19. So if you bought at $80, now you're sitting on a massive uh, loss. And the crazy thing though, about the stock is um, despite this massive decline, you know, someone might think to themselves, Oh, that must be cheap then because it was 80. Now it's 20. So I'm going to try to buy now and, and I think you can do well. But the problem is I'm going to pull this up so I can give you the, the exact number, uh, here. The valuations of the stock are completely crazy. Uh, the stock, the company loses nine dollars and 77 cents, uh, a share and, uh, it's got a 15 billion dollar uh market cap and it's just overvalued e- even though it's fallen so much that doesn't mean it's really cheap on a fundamental uh basis uh so that's the problem and why you know the market can can actually uh go lower in fact uh the price to sales ratio on Robin Hood is 9.73 it's almost 10. Well, what's that mean? Uh, that's not price to earnings. That's price to sales, the revenue of the company. And in the real world, um, if you were to go buy a business, you say a restaurant or something, you would not pay 10 times price to sales. You'd pay, you'd look to pay three times earnings or something, not 10 times just revenue. And a classic book that I read, uh, that was the Bible of, you know, trying to buy earnings growth stocks in the 90s. Back then, that was the way to make, you know, you were told buy growth stocks, company stocks of companies that have high earnings growth. And, uh, this classic book, One Up on Wall Street, uh, was written and, uh, it did a study and it showed that, you know, if you want one metric, do a pro- look for stocks, a price to sales ratio of, 0.5 that have huge earnings growth down the road and buy them and, and that's how you beat the market. Well, you, in, in, in their view, uh, a two meant it was fully valued. Well, Robin Hood is 10 and that's why, you know, even the, that's why the market, all the, these stocks can keep going down. And I think, you know, are going to do it. Look, Robin Hood's in a bear market. It, it's, uh, trading well below its 200 day and 30 day and 50 day moving averages. And it's the story of many stocks in the market that, you know, these high flyers and specter stocks. That's why it's so, that's why it's very similar to the internet stock bubble. Because, um, while one of books like one up on Wall Street were advocating, you know, look at these valuation metrics by growth stocks, you know, in the nineties, Ken Fisher was someone also that popularized the idea of look for low price to sales ratios. The thing is, by 1999, people stopped doing that, uh, looking for actual earnings figures, and they started buying Internet stocks that made no money and had page views. Uh, 
<laughs> and we're saying we got all these page views, and that means we're we're, we're worth something. Now, anyone saying that now would be laughed at. Um, and then the equivalent of that is buying stocks, you know, or, or crypto coins that have no earnings, and it's all a promise. Uh, and, and it's just uh, very similar to what happened in 2000. Uh, in, in another similarity, you know, I think we talked about this on on your show uh, recently, but one of the IPOs in November was Rivian Automotive, and it's got it's a, uh, supposed to be one of these electric car companies, but it has no revenue at all, and it's priced as if it's worth more than the Ford Motor Company. So these type of insane stocks. You know, you got to really go back to 1999 to see anything like it. And that's why I think, you know, the parallel to the stock market uh, in the past is not 2008 or 2007, you know, from what what, what is going to cause bear market, but 2000, uh, I believe. And, of course, that was the, the big dot-com com bubble that burst. I remember a couple of 15-year-old kids getting $3 million because they created a web page. I mean, nowadays, uh, you use a template and you make a, a web page for free. Why would they get $3 million for it back in 2000? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. I mean, I think there's the one, come, what was it? Was that the globe.com or something? Oh, there were so many of them. One. There were hundreds there's, of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, when we're in conditions like that, I also notice cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, at least, has also taken a, a major dive. And and uh, Eric Haddock, who will be on the show uh, tomorrow, he was saying to us uh, in previous interviews, it seems to follow what the S&P does. If you look at Bitcoin itself, other cryptos might be doing differently. Are they in danger uh, of blinking out or do you think they still will stick around? But uh, they haven't fallen as far as they're going to. Well, I don't, I don't think I don't think they're gonna go like vanish. Um, instead, I think what'll eventually happen with all these crypto coins, frankly, is that uh, they will continue to exist. I don't see a reason why they would wouldn't. They're not like stocks that can go bankrupt. You know, they don't represent anything. They're just things on a on a you know on an exchange, uh, I, I, but I think they'll go like the way H and S food stamps went, it, meaning that H uh, and S food stamps are a big thing in the in the sixties and seventies, uh, and, uh, and now you know no one even knows what they are. But I'm sure they still exist somewhere, you know, in someone's attic or something. Uh, but it's not like they all. You know, went and, you know, vanished and went in a fire or something. So what I'm trying to say is that I think these crypto coins are not going to go away, but I think that eventually no one's going to care about them. They'll, they'll still exist, <laughs> but no one's going to be trading them. No one's going to be looking at them. They're just going to be there. You know, they'll be worth nothing, but they'll still be there. No one, no one, I mean, that might sound funny, but you know, they have no, you know, the only value they have is because people trade them. That's it. And, but if they go down in price uh, over time, which I think they will, then eventually no one's going to be really caring about trading all these coins. And I just think the volume in them will vanish, and they just you know, won't really mean anything. But I think Eric is right with uh, the correlation. Uh, you, I mean, you can statistically measure it. The correlation between Bitcoin and other, you know, things that trade out there. And it's most closely correlated with S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Uh, what that means is that since Bitcoin has existed, when the stock market has gone up, it has gone up more than the stock market. But when the stock market corrects, it just crashes. Uh, that's been, it crashes more than the stock market. So I, there's no reason to think that's going to stop. Uh, but what it means, what's important about that, is that it has no relationship to other currencies. So a lot of Bitcoin people or crypto fans, they say, oh, this is a safe haven. It's You buy it because there's going to be a currency crisis 
and the U.S. dollar will go down, and everyone's going to use Bitcoin, so Bitcoin will go up. Well, there's no statistical relationship between the price of Bitcoin and what the U.S. dollar does. So that argument is just fantasy, uh, and that's why the real relationship is what matters. So when I think that we're headed for a bear market in the stock market, what that means for Bitcoin in crypto is we're looking at a complete, total collapse for these cryptocurrencies to start, you know, when the stock market uh, breaks the 200-day moving averages. And Bitcoin's already come down uh, to about 45,000, dropping almost 20,000 points in just a few weeks when the S&P 500 hasn't even pulled back 5%. So if you get a 20% or 30% pullback in the S&P 500, you know, you look for crypto and Bitcoin to go back Look for Bitcoin to go to twenty or ten thousand again, or or worse, uh, and then who knows if it'll even recover? Because uh, I think in time it's just going to go to nothing. Because uh, it's it's just uh, the one you know I've got to start to ramble, <laughs> repeat myself. But uh, it's just um, well, all those schools just, and hospitals El Salvador was planning to build with Bitcoin powered by a volcano to do the Bitcoin mining, perhaps that was a, a dream that's also disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's one thing that's interesting about that is um, if you the idea that Bitcoin would replace the dollar for any currency to replace another one, what it needs is to be easy to use and more stable, and Bitcoin is neither. Uh, so what ends up happening is in only one country in the entire world – does Bitcoin, you know, become something that can replace a national currency? And that's in El Salvador where a dictator dictates that everyone must accept it that way. It passes a law and uses the force of the state to, to, <laughs> to prop up the, the Bitcoin. You know, so that tells you everything I think we need to know about the relationship of cryptocurrency, you know, with, uh, freedom or, or, or libertarianism or whatever you want to call it, uh, it, it it's it's um, it's more fantasy than, than anything. But what captivated people when it comes to Bitcoin and crypto, you know, it made them interested in these theories is simply the fact that it went up a lot, uh, <laughs> nothing else. And when anything in the financial markets goes up a lot uh, the way that did, then people get enamored with it and in 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 leaders of the sector or gurus or whatever you want to call them they will create stories and theories to tell you why this is just great and it's going to go up forever and it's the future and all this stuff's going to happen but back in 1999 people said that about the internet stocks and they were saying back then the phrase was new economy new economy uh is going to replace the old economy and then the 2000 bear market came and what happened these internet stocks completely crashed and the so-called old economy stocks are what did the best uh along the mining stocks for the next decade you know gold stocks came alive uh but so did energy stocks and uh the, you know in the in that decade of the 2000s uh oil and energy were among the hottest things to invest in you can't get more so-called old economy than that so again i think we're sort of set up for that also over the next couple of years um where the fantasies are going to fizzle out and the people that bought into crypto believing all this stuff uh are going to go on a wild ride and when they get off of it they'll have some money left and they're going to i think will return to more things rooted in the real economy and not fantasy land Mike, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. Great to talk with you. My guest has been Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. If you have any questions for Mike or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com, and we'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. 
Available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.